This podcast is part of the Shareable Podcast Network. Learn more at shareable.fm. Not every guest takes me up on the opportunity, but I like to do a segment called The Mic Swap, where I make my guest into the host, and then I become the guest. I let them take the conversation wherever they want to take it, ask me whatever they want, and uh, it's a lot of fun, I think. This is Mic Swap. So welcome back to Shareable. I am your host, Aurora Winter, and today I have a surprise treat for you. The special guest is Jeff Gibbard. He's formerly known as the world's most handsome social media and content marketing strategist, but now he goes by the simple title, Superhero. So Jeff Gibbard is the founder of the Superhero Institute, a certification program for coaches that want to help their clients grow revenues and unlock their potential to make a positive impact on the world. Jeff is also a professional speaker, the host of the popular podcast Shareable, and the author of the forthcoming book, The Lovable Leader. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's so great to have you. So why did you start the Superhero Institute? So I started the Superhero Institute. Originally, um, I knew I wanted to do something with like superheroes in real life, like helping people become superheroes, helping them behave more like superheroes in different avenues of their life. And I started it out as like a coaching program where I coached other people, but that was only because I hadn't had time to fully develop the, uh, the whole concept as I was kind of like next phase of the career. But what I ultimately wanted to turn out to be was this coaching certification program where I helped basically build other superhero coaches. Um, So I started it because the world's a mess and I think work generally sucks and people hate it. And um, I think people don't understand quite how much potential they have and how there is a linear path to actually unlocking it. Um, And I, I want people who are empowered to do what they want to do in this life, to be happy, to be free. And I think that there's a process for getting there. Tell me the story about your mom, but this time I would like you to tell me with all of your being, not just your mind, but also your heart. And, and if it does relate to you starting the superhero Institute or not, let us know. So I think that it does. So the, the story goes like this. Um, my mother was in a catastrophic car accident Uh, She was in a Jeep Grand Cherokee. She was on this road that was supposed to have been paved, but the township kept putting it off and putting it off. So it wasn't particularly well paved. It was rainy day. It was my last day of high school. And she was going over one town over because she wanted to go to the supermarket that had the good fish market because we were going to have a party to celebrate my graduation from high school. So in the middle of the day, so I had taken the car in the morning. We shared a car. Basically, I drove her car in the middle of the day. We met up and I gave her my car or her car that is. And, um, And she went off to go uh, get this fish town over. And I went back to school. So I get home and my grandmother is there when I get home and she comes out to like meet me and she looks very somber. Obviously I'm thrilled because it's last day of high school. I'm on to the next phase of my life. Everything great. Gonna have a party. And I find out mom's been in a car accident. So what happened was there was this company called Guaranteed Overnight Delivery. It's a, a They have like tractor trailers and they ship and haul things. Anyway, it was coming around on this poorly non-paved road. It fishtailed and it basically like ripped off the whole side of her car. And she had, strangely enough, right behind her was an ER doc from North Shore Hospital, which was like not far away. So he like cut her seatbelt, got her out, this and that. Long story short, she's in the operating room for like eight hours. She gets like nine pints of blood and she's basically in a coma for like three weeks. So really, really awful traumatic brain injury, frontal lobe. And, you know, obviously we don't know if she's going to live, she's going to die and all the whole thing. And, um, you know, I'm still trying to get ready for college. I've got the summer where I'm like trying to save up money. I'm coming to Philadelphia. We're in New York. So I don't know what's going to happen. And essentially, as I'm going off to school, um, you know, she's still in rehab. She's like conscious again. And she's kind of like talking, but like still making her way back. She winds up going to a rehab facility in Philadelphia. And over the next like, you know, couple, couple of years, she starts to kind of come back to being like a person again, able to talk and all that. Um, but her life immeasurably changed over the next 20 years as she was not really the same woman prior to the accident as she was after. And obviously my life changed. My relationship to her changed pretty dramatically. 
Um, but I would say the biggest thing that came out of it, all the sob story aside of the whole thing, like we all have our traumas. That one's obviously a big one and I'm not dismissing it, but I would say that the main thing that came out of it that I think is a, a major identity shaper is, um, a, a real hyper vigilance in life, like a real always on watch. There is always danger lurking around the corner when things look like they're good. I'm waiting. I'm prepared. I am on guard for something to go wrong. So if business is going great, I am perpetually sitting on a state of immense fear of everything's going to get taken away. And that was from that incident that here I am, I'm, you know, 18 years old. Uh, everything's going great. I'm about to go off to college, you know, everything's awesome. And, uh, that happens. So now that's been sort of a pattern that I unconsciously am able to recognize coming up time and time again. So it doesn't matter that there's all of this, uh, it's like selection bias, right? Like it doesn't even matter if I, if all of these wonderful things do happen, if there's one negative, like I could drop my keys and stub my toe or something. And I'm like, see, see, there it is. Everything's going great today, but I stub my toe. So, um, so yeah, so, so that is, you know, an incredibly pivotal moment in my life. And at the same time, the other thing that came out of outside of the hypervigilance is that I kind of overnight, um, overnight, over 20 years became a bit of a caretaker. And I was ill-equipped for that at different points in my life, either financially or just maturity level or whatever. But I had to do a lot of things for my mom, take care of a lot of things, a lot of things that were really frustrating to me, like paperwork and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So um, I learned a lot about how to be more patient, uh, frontal lobe injury. She can be very angry and outbursty. And I learned a lot about how to be patient, how to take care of things and do things I didn't want to do. And, uh, generally just to, I think it unlocked a level of compassion in me that, um, I may not have been able to access otherwise. Yeah. So profoundly shaped who you are. I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we have a lot in common there. I, I realized I also have that hypervigilance thing. It's a super highway in the brain after yeah. something like that, which can trigger post-traumatic stress. Um, yeah. So does this relate to starting the Superhero Institute, this experience with your mother? Yeah. So there's two kind of big ways I think that it relates. Um, and, it, and I think to a certain extent, like we talked about this um, when you were on my show, but that a lot of decisions are made emotionally and then we rationalize them. And I think to a certain extent, we can connect dots in our heads between things like that may not necessarily be linear, but are connected because it all exists inside of our experience, right? So I think the first thing is that I was given a very, very cold shower into the idea that life is short. And yeah. you never know when your time is going to get, like when your ticket's getting called, right? Because yeah. like my mom had all of these aspirations and dreams. Like she was, uh, she was absolutely brilliant. She got into um, Fordham on this like incredible scholarship that like they only give out to like four people or something like that. Like, so like my mom was like upper echelon. She wanted to go into geriatric social work. She wanted to help, you know, people transition as they age. She had all these ambitions and dreams and then boom, gone. And after that, she just couldn't stay focused. She couldn't this, she couldn't that. Her marriage to my stepfather fell apart. So like, I see that and I, I think her life changed in an instant. And it wasn't anything that she did. It just happened to her, right? And I think for me, what I got out of that is, a, and, and by the way, my father was a funeral director. So like, you want to talk about like the kind of the, the hitting me from both sides of it, you know, life is short. And I was painfully aware of that throughout most of my entire life. And, and it was punctuated by that accident. So the first thing is, is that if, if life is short and whether you believe in an afterlife or you don't, um, you look at this time that you have here and it is precious and it is finite and you don't know how finite it is. And I believe personally that you have a responsibility to use whatever your gifts are in service of others and to make the world a better place. That's my values. That's how I live my life. Um, I, I am not comfortable with a taker mindset. I am very much a giver mindset. That is how I find a lot of satisfaction in life is helping others. So because I view life as being short, uh, you know, affected impacted by that accident, um, I tend to put my all into 
my work being a reflection of my values and of my life. So building the Superhero Institute is very much around, I need to make as big of an impact as I can while I'm here. I don't have a lot of time to do this. So I got to do it fast. Well, what's interesting is that in a moment, in a day, your mother's life completely changed in totally unexpected ways that uh, shortchanged her, let us use gentle language. Yeah. But on the other hand, in that same day, a superhero was called forth because he was needed. And that was you. And some of us don't get the call from something as dramatic as you experienced with your, with your mother's accident and, and subsequent aftermath of the accident, or I experienced with my husband's death and the subsequent aftermath, which called me forth to be a really good single mom to a four-year-old. But I see perhaps the Superhero Institute can call forth the hero that lies dormant within each one of us yeah. and allow people to live up to their full potential. I didn't even make this particular connection until you said this, but almost every superhero story begins with tragedy. Yeah. Superman, his planet blew up. Batman, his parents were killed. Spider-Man, his uncle was killed. Um, Tony Stark uh, captured, saw that all of his weapons of, of, you know, destruction were leading to a worse off world. And he, you know, got his, his chest blown to bits and had to like, you know, work his way out of it. Um, you know, Steve Rogers, scrawny little kid, always wanted to do a thing, was given this amazing opportunity and like watched his best friend supposedly die. Like all tragedy after tragedy after tragedy and responsibility to see that other people don't suffer these same tragedies. Um, and to it's do what the you hero's can journey. It, it's yeah, the hero's journey. You absolutely. cannot you cannot be a hero on the couch watching TV. The yeah. hero always faces enormous obstacles enough to crush him or her. And we admire the person who digs deep and finds resources within that they didn't even know they had and over overcomes this obstacle. We admire heroes and heroines. We, you know, watch them in movies, we read about them in books, but when it happens in our own life, Sometimes we feel like a victim, but we could also choose to feel like this is the beginning of a hero's journey. If we choose to get support, like I'm sure you provide and your coaches provide, uh, you know, with a, the Superhero Institute, we can transform what could be a tragedy into a calling to become everything that we can be, as you did, Jeff. Yeah. Well done. Kudos to you. Well, thank you. But, and, and you kind of set me up for the second point, which is a shorter one, which is that one, so the, the superhero Institute is built on what I call the superhero code. And it's 10, 10 different elements that make you a superhero that keep you in line to be a hero rather than a villain, because becoming super powered, you can be down a path of, you know, the dark side and the light side. Right. So I created the superhero code. And one of those 10 elements is resilience. And mm -hmm. I can think of no greater experience in my own life to teach me resilience than what happened to my mom. And yeah. when I, when it came to putting together the code, one of the first ones that came to my mind is I was like, well, what makes a superhero? And it's the ability to keep getting back up after something happens to us. It's the ability yeah. to stare down something that is really challenging and continually get back up. And one of the other, um, parts of the code is courage. So being scared and doing it anyway, you know, like, so, so I mentioned the hypervigilance thing, the fact that I'm scared doesn't give me a pass to not keep pushing forward on that mission to keep pushing forward and doing what I came here to do. Yeah. I'm scared sometimes, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's the difference between courage and bravery. Bravery is just having no fear going into something almost foolishly. Whereas courage is acknowledging the fear and choosing to move past it anyway. And I actually really, really you know, we're both a big fan of words. I really hemmed and hawed about all the different words in there and the tiny distinction between words like that, courage and bravery. I would say the courage and the resilience from the code absolutely come out of my experiences. Well, courage comes from the French cour, heart. Heart. So, you know, there's a, a brave heart in that. I wonder if you want to talk about Iron Man versus Spider-Man and perhaps relate to the other things in your code. Um, I could definitely, because the code includes a lot of things. So, so the code is uh, the following. Uh, uh, resilience, courage, 
uh, confidence, vulnerability, responsibility, protection, compassion, self-sacrifice, empathy, and growth. Those are the 10 things that make a superhero. All That'd make days. a super life, just living those things. Yeah. So that's what I commit to every single morning is living those values, living, living that code. Um, and then there's the superhuman framework, which is the process of, you would totally love the superhuman framework. It's learning, thinking, communicating, leading, and realizing. So it's like, that's like everything love it. and it's amazing and it's totally up your alley. But yeah. so when I think about, um, when I think about superheroism, my favorite superhero, I've said many, many times over is Spider-Man. I just, I love the purity of the, the desire to just help people, the yeah. resp- the feeling of that responsibility, that weight to do the right thing, because ultimately like doing the right thing is hard sometimes and mm. it's challenging and it sucks. And I think when I look at, you know, to your original question about Spider-Man versus Iron Man, I think when you have one character who is poor, basically, who is smart, who lost someone close to them, and that instilled in them a value to protect other people because they lost someone, and Mm -hmm. that because they have ability, that they have a responsibility to use that in service of others, that just resonates with me. Like, it hits me in my feels. Iron Man, I look at, you have a billionaire playboy philanthropist who can build suits of armor and mm. makes all of these, uh, you know, ambitious but egotistical um, decisions to try and know what's best for everyone, as opposed to knowing what's best for themselves and trying to just help. That doesn't resonate with me. Now, I still think Iron Man's a badass and I'm like totally into like the whole character and Robert Downey Jr. is the man and I loved all the movies and all that. And, and they did kind of resurrect the self-sacrifice part at the end of the this Marvel Cinematic Universe run of Endgame where Tony Stark, spoilers, snaps his fingers and, and you know, sacrifices himself for everybody. Um, but I, when I look at all of the different aspects that make up any of these different superheroes, the thing that always gets pulled out is like this willingness to self-sacrifice, the responsibility, the courage, like being, you know, being vulnerable, like acknowledging that you have vulnerabilities, all of these different things, I think, come together and make you realize like, you're not perfect. You are flawed. You have vulnerabilities, but you still can choose to live into the responsibility to make the world a better place, to protect other people. And that the best way you can do that is to continually grow yourself. I think I'm going to use the superhero code when I'm media coaching people, because oftentimes it's hard for experts to be vulnerable but it's essential. That's where empathy comes from. That's where we know what you really care about. And we don't trust people unless they're willing to be vulnerable. You know, as a coach, uh, I will share whatever I think will be of service to the other person to make it safe for them to share whatever's up with them. Like, you know, it can be uncomfortable to just share everything. (laughs) You're feeling naked and the other person's got their suit and tie on. It's like, you know, a mismatch. So I love that you've got vulnerability. Well, that. so that one is actually my kryptonite in the code. That's my hardest one to deal mm. with. All the rest of them, I think, come very naturally in the way I think about things. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with like the Enneagram, but my Enneagram profile is I'm an eight, which is like strength and like protect the weak and like show no vulnerability. So mm. like I struggle with anything that would show weakness or vulnerability. Like I just like I put the whole the weight on my shoulders and I carry it up the hill. Right. So like self-sacrifice and courage and resilience, all those things like, yeah, no problem. Vulnerability. No, that's terrifying. I'm going to go the other way. (laughs) So, so for me, having that in there is partly a reminder because the thing is, is that if you don't have vulnerability in that code, you run the risk of thinking that you're superior. You run the risk of thinking you are better than other people, which is not the point. The point is to leverage the strengths you have, to make the world a better place and protect people, but it doesn't mean you're better. You're on the same level and the vulnerability kind of keeps you in check and reminds you. And it also helps you to connect with other people, as you said, right? Yeah. So would you be open to a tiny bit of media coaching, which will help you later when you're marketing your book? I would love it. Yeah, sure. So I love you. I love what you're up to. I think it's, it's fantastic. I think the message really needs to get out in a bigger way. So later, when you are not talking on a podcast with your friend Aurora Winter, but when you are on, uh, I don't know, television and you've only got five minutes, it'd be really great to condense your story. And so what I love to uh, help people with is just understand the story structure. And I'm coming more from like a film 
background because that's my yeah that's by the way my, my under my undergraduate was film and media arts we are definitely celestial making, siblings i'm celestial saying it. siblings i like the alliteration on that too so once people understand the different frameworks then you can you can just add in whatever story you like so the heroes the hero's story can start high or it can start low um tony robbins hero story starts low so i'll give you it's like an upside down top hat is this mm -hmm. the shape of the story so you can start high and then collapse low uh then there's struggle 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 at least three because three the brain goes one two many three is many yeah. so three is good and then you have the turning point which is a, the epiphany and then the tricky thing is not to trail off into 20 year story but to make it go straight up to the high point Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, my story, I could use my story. I was going to use Tony Robbins, but I guess I'll use mine. <laughs> um, Ooh, use mine. <laughs> shall I use yours? Okay. Yeah. Use mine. I'd love to hear. I do this with people all the time. So I do a lot of like pitching and I have yeah. different pitching frameworks and I use like the story brand framework and stuff. But like, as you know, I'm sure it is impossible to take your own stuff and like turn it into something coherent. Exactly. That's why everybody needs a media coach or every writer needs an editor. Otherwise it's just like echo exactly. chamber. Okay. So this is me saying your story and you'll fix it because I'll make uh, mistakes and, and you'll improve it. Rough draft. Cool. Just get me draft. close. Yeah. Get me close. Well, it was so awesome. I was just about to graduate from high school. We were planning a big party. We we're going to have everybody over. My mom was going off to get, you know, fish from the neighboring town because it was going to be like a super special day because Finally, 12 years of school were over and I was going off to university. So I was totally jazzed on a complete high. And I came home from school. <laughs> I have graduated. And when I opened the door, my grandmother looked completely. However she looked, whatever word would be right. Um, devastated. Devastated. Thank you. Good, powerful word. Yeah. And she told me that my mother had been in a car accident. And I could tell from the look on her face that it was touch and go if she would live. And in that moment, my whole life turned upside down. I went from being on the highest high that had been for 12 years to all of a sudden my mother's life was hanging by an edge. And fast forward, she didn't, she did survive, but she didn't get better and didn't get all the way better. And I struggled to be a good son and to become the man that was potential within me because I, not because I was ready, but because I had to, then we need three struggles. So I struggled to learn to deal with paperwork. I struggled to learn to deal with the, um, the emotional outbursts. Yep. Yes. Thank you. That's what I was thinking, but I wanted to respect you. The, the mood swings and abuse that, go with the kind of brain damage that she had. I struggled to deal with my stepfather who paradoxically had a funeral parlor uh, leaving and that whole thing falling apart. So it was on my shoulders. But the turning point was when I realized that even though I was still young, there was a superhero within me. And I decided Maybe there's a story, but I decided that I was going to live up to my full potential to be the man that my mother needed me to be. And that wasn't just any ordinary Joe Blow. That was a superhero. And I decided to live by the superhero creed, which has these 10 points, which I'll tell you later. It's not like everything was perfect in the second, but I tell you that moment of decision of deciding to live by this become the superhero changed everything. And I went from despair, suicidal thoughts and blank to instead feeling on top of the world, feeling like I'm making a difference, hosting a podcast, launching the superhero Institute, seeing my mother look up to me with such admiration and love and appreciation because I was there for her in her darkest hour. And I'm still there for her. It's not always been easy. But what I can honestly say is that turning point of deciding to become the superhero that was within me changed my entire life, changed my mother's life, changed my family's life. And now I'm on a mission to change the world because there's a superhero within you. Love it. Love it. It's really cool to get to see someone do it from the other side of that. <laughs> yeah. 
It's always fun. Yeah. No, it was yeah. awesome. That was really awesome. I, it's, um, it's very hard to look at your own story like that. But when you were telling, it, I was like, yeah. 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 You go, yeah. guy. Yeah. I, would, I would be interested to listen to this human being talk. Yeah. Well, I'll send you the podcast recording. <laughs> you can memorize it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad that you're going to do that for me. All right. Well, there's so much more we could talk about, but I think we might need a part two. But I did want to ask you one more question about this, and uh, then I'll give you a moment to you know, call out whatever you'd like to call out. But my last big question is, what is the worst advice that you were ever given? Worst advice that I was ever given. I mean, the I'm trying to like verbalize what it probably was or even think about who might have said it. But like, I think the kind of generalized prevailing wisdom of like get good grades and get a good job <laughs> is just about the stupid advice, stupidest <laughs> advice that I've, that I've ever heard for me. Okay. For me, I'm, I am not trying to crap on people who like went that path and they are happy. Like that's cool. For me, what I discovered was anytime I tried to live into that narrative, I was miserable. I've literally never been happy as an employee ever, like not even close. I've like, I had, I have like maybe like a six month runway where I can fool myself into thinking that I don't hate everything, but I like legitimately just couldn't do it. And my mom back to the mom, I, so I had started my company in 2011 and at some point, like I had been in business for like six years and she was like, you need to get a job. I was like, I have a company. I built one. Like, how can you not appreciate? Anyway. So the advice that's terrible is go to school, get good grades, get a good job, you know, get married, have kids, that whole thing. Like I got married, have kids, but like I took a different route on the job thing. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. That's uh, that's <laughs> the path he wants to be an employee. All right. This has been so cool. This has been so fun. What do you want to, uh, to, to share to kind of be the icing on the cake of this episode? Ah, uh, man, I don't know. I, I just think it's really cool that uh, I get to talk to people like you and I get to come on podcasts like shareable been meaning to for a very long time. Thank you for the invite. Um, I would just say like, Hey, if anybody wants to know more about the stuff that I work on, or, if, you know, got more out of listening to this episode and learning more about me through this and you want to know more, go to jeffgibber.com and that's got links to everything I do. And I'm your host, Aurora Winter. And again, our, our guest today has been Jeff Gibbard, awesome guy uh, with the forthcoming book, The Lovable Leader. And this has been a very shareable podcast. Wait, don't leave. If you've never listened to my fancy outro, do it just once for me, please. Okay, if you enjoy shareable and you find it valuable, there's a few ways that you can support the show. One, you can share it on social media, which I strongly encourage. I mean, it's literally the name of the show, Shareable. Two, you can review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're an Overcast user, as many of my listeners are, make sure to click that star button on the episodes that you like. The third way that you can support the show is by blogging about it or discussing it on your own podcast or even by making a YouTube video where you talk about one of the episodes. And then the final way that you can support the show is by supporting it directly on Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. Now, before I let you go, I want to tell you about one other thing. You see, Shareable is just one of many projects that I'm working on at any given time. I've got another podcast called Rogue. I do a live streaming show every week called The Heroic Council. I've got a blog where I release a blog post twice a week. And if you're looking to keep up with all sorts of different content that can help you grow and become a superhero in life, I want you to check out jeffgibber.me. That's where I list all of my current projects and projects that are coming up in the future, including my forthcoming book, The Lovable Leader. It would mean a lot to me if you could go and check out some of the other things I've worked on because I put just as much of my heart into those projects as I do into Shareable. Thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you for being a supporter. And I hope to see you here on the next episode of Shareable.